Entailment is one of the central notions in logic. When do the premises of an argument entail the conclusion? How do we understand that? Let's have a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to Attic Philosophy. On this channel we're looking at all aspects of philosophy from metaphysics to applied social issues. In this series of videos we are looking at an introduction to logic and in this video we're looking at the concept of entailment. How do we understand it? What does it mean? And how does it relate to other bits of logic we've learned like truth tables? Entailment is really central to logic because Logic is all about good arguments, telling the good arguments from the bad arguments, and for logical purposes, a good argument is a valid one. That is one in which the premises entail the conclusions. So if we can work out what entailment amounts to and devise ways of testing for entailment, we're a long way along to understanding logic. Let's start with a key concept in our definition of entailment, the concept of a valuation. Not evaluation, but a valuation. We're going to use valuations to define what we mean by entailment. A valuation is a function, a valuation function, and it assigns to each primitive sentence letter P, Q, R, a truth value, true or false. And we're going to write that as T, or if it was falsity, F. So we're going to write lots of things like this. VP equals T, and that means the valuation V assigns the letter P the value T for truth. Here is our valuation function, that is the V. Here is our truth value, that's the T. And we read this as saying P is true on valuation V, or P is true according to valuation V, or we could say valuation V makes P true. They all mean the same thing. So the job of a valuation function is to assign a T or an F to each of the primitive sentence letters, P, Q, R. So in the last video, we looked at truth tables. How do valuations relate to truth tables? Because the job of a valuation function is to assign a T or an F to each of the primitive sentence letters, P, Q, R, each line in a truth table corresponds to a different valuation. Okay, so looking at this truth table here, we've got four lines because we've got two sentence letters, P and Q. So we've got four valuations there. We might call those V1, V2, V3, V4. Just to distinguish between them, we've got four different ones there. And then we might write things down like, so according to V1, they're both true. So we, we might write down V1 assigns P the value true. Uh, what else have we got? V3 assigns P the value false and so on. Okay, so we could present things as a truth table or we could present things like this. It kind of amounts to the same thing. So valuations don't just relate to primitive sentences, P, Q or R. We want to talk about complex sentences as well. So sentences like this one that we looked at in the previous video, we, we drew its truth table. What do the different valuations say about this? Well, let's look at this valuation here, the top line. Let's call that V. So we're looking at this line here. According to that valuation, this sentence gets the value T. So that sentence is true on that valuation. How do we write that down without writing the whole big long English sentence? Some people write it out like this. So they say, here's the sentence we're interested in. According to V, it takes the value T. To me, that's a slightly confusing way of doing things because we just said that valuations assign T's and F's to the primitive sentence letters, and here we're assigning it to a sentence that isn't a primitive, so I think that can get a bit confusing. Anyway, I'm going to write it out in a slightly different way using a slightly different bit of notation. I'm going to use this symbol here. We'll call it the turnstile because it kind of looks a bit like a, like a turnstile that you walk over. OK, and what we're going to write is a valuation on the left and a sentence on the right. And this is going to mean that the valuation V makes the sentence A true. 
or to put it a different way, A is true on according to valuation V. So we are going to have to learn a new symbol here. So that's kind of a downside. But the upside is when we look at other types of logics, even logics where valuations can't be used, we can reuse this symbol. So we're going to see this symbol crop up quite a lot as we go through the logic course. OK, so it's a good idea to introduce it and get used to it now. Going back to the previous example, we had this sentence here. We said it's true on valuation V1. So we'll write this. V1 makes this sentence true. OK, now we've got the concept of valuations sorted. We can build up to what we're really after, which is a definition of entailment. It's going to go like this. Suppose we're interested in some premises, A and B, and a conclusion, C, and we want to know whether those premises really do entail that conclusion. Since we're going to be talking about entailment an awful lot, it's good to have a kind of a shorthand symbol for it. And we're going to reuse that very same symbol that we just introduced. OK, so we've already used it once to talk about evaluation making a sentence true. We're going to reuse it to talk about premises entailing a conclusion. OK, so it's kind of got a dual use. This always means the premises entail the conclusion. OK, what's our definition of that? Basically, entailment is a guarantee that if the premises are true, then so is the conclusion. OK, so more precisely, that's going to mean on any valuation, on any line of the truth table, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true too. That's a positive way of putting it in terms of any valuation. But here's another way of putting it, like a negative way of putting it. It can't be the case that some valuation makes the premises true and the conclusion false. OK, so no valuation makes all the premises true, but also the conclusion false. They're equivalent ways of defining entailment. How do we use truth tables to help us with entailment, to test for an entailment? Well, what we're going to do is this. Suppose we're interested in whether premises A and B really do entail some conclusion C. We're going to write them at the top of a truth table. Let's suppose they all involve just two sentence letters P and Q. So we're going to have four lines in our truth table. TT, TF, FT, FF. And let's just suppose when we do the truth table for each sentence, here's the table for A, here's the table for B, here's the table for C. Let's just suppose it comes out like that. Would that be a case of entailment? Well, what we need to check is, first, are there any cases where both premises are true? Yeah, there's one case, that's here. And then secondly, in those cases, is the conclusion also true? So there's one case to check. And yeah, the conclusion is also true. We have entailment there. The premises, A, B, entail the conclusion. An equivalent way of checking would be, is there any valuation, any line that makes both premises true and the conclusion false? No, because like we just checked, there's only one where they're both true and that's not got an F in it. OK, so that's a genuine case of entailment. The premises entail the conclusion. OK, but suppose instead our truth table for A, B and C had come out looking like this. OK, so this is a slightly different combination of T's and F's. Would we then have an entailment from premises to conclusion? Well, let's do the same thing again. Let's look at the lines where both premises are true. Now we've got two of those lines here and here. And in this line, we've still got a T, but here we've got an F. So here we have a line where the premises are true, but the conclusion's false. So there we don't have entailment. OK, the premises could be true whilst the conclusion is false. So that's not an entailment. So this was a schematic explanation of how we do it with A's, B and C's, any old sentence. Let's look at a specific example and see how to do that in practice. Let's take this sentence, P and Q or R, to be our single premise, and this sentence, P or R, to be our conclusion. Does that premise entail that conclusion? Let's draw a truth table and find out. We list out the two sentences at the top of a table. And over on the left, we write down P, Q and R because those are the three sentence letters that occur in these sentences. P, 
Because we've got three sentence letters there, there's going to be eight lines in the truth table. OK, so let's just pause for a second, think about how we draw out an eight line truth table, because people sometimes get a bit confused here. OK, we're going to need all combinations of T's and F's to three sentences. If we try and write out these eight lines one by one and try to get every combination, that, that can work, but you chances are you're maybe going to miss one or get them in a weird order or something like that. And it, it can be a bit tricky. So I don't recommend writing this out line by line. Rather, it's better to do it column by column, starting over on the right. The rightmost column goes TF, 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 just like it did when we had a four line truth table. Apart from there, we just had four lines. The middle column is going to go TT, FF, TT, FF. And the left column is going to go TT, TT, FF, FF. OK, so over on the right, we're alternating every line. Here we're alternating every two lines. Here we're alternating every four lines. And if you had a 16 line truth table, you'd have an extra column over on the left that would alternate every eight lines. And then if you had a 32 line truth table, and so on and so on. OK, so however big they get, if you follow this way of drawing it out column by column, starting on the right, it shouldn't get confusing. And by the way, you're hardly ever going to have to draw truth tables bigger than this in a logic class. It just gets too kind of big to write down on a bit of paper. OK, so we've got our sentences, the premise and the conclusion. We've got our primitives. We've got all combinations of T's and F's. What does the truth table look like? So we're going to start with this and here. We're looking at where both P and Q are true. So that column is going to come out like this. It's true in the top two lines, but false in all the others. Now we can look at this or. So we're looking at when we have either a T here or a T in the R column. So that's going to look like this. So that's this sentence done. Now we look at this sentence. And we're looking at when we have a T in either the P column or the R column. So that's going to look like this. So now we're interested in this column here and this column here. Is it the case that whenever we have a T in this column, we also have a T in that column? So we've got a T there, 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 there and there. And over here, yeah, all of those are T's. So there and there and there, there and there. OK, so whenever there's a T here, there's a T here. Equivalently, there's no line that has a T here, but not here. So we have an entailment. This entails this. And we would write it like this. This premise entails that conclusion. What about if we were interested in the entailment going the other way? So going from this sentence to this sentence, would that be an entailment? Let's have a look. So again, we draw out the truth table because we've already worked all this out. I've just swapped these things round. But now we're interested in if we have a T here, do we also have a T here? Let's look. Now we have a T and a T, a T and a T, a T and a T. Ah, here's a T and an F. We don't actually need to go any further because we only need one case where there's a T here, but not here. That's enough to show us that we don't have entailment. OK, so this premise doesn't entail this conclusion. And we can write that down like this, the entailment sign. And we put a line through it. OK, so I've just kind of put a diagonal line through the entailment symbol to say that the premise doesn't entail the conclusion. Counter examples. Whenever we have a case where the premises don't entail the conclusion, OK, so we don't have entailment, we can give a counter example. A counterexample is a case, a way in which the premises are true, but the conclusion's false. How do we describe a counterexample? Well, we just use the truth table that we used to work out that the premises don't entail the conclusion. So going back to the truth table that we just did, we said that we have a T here and an F here. So this fourth line down here, this is our counterexample. More specifically, the counter example is the valuation. And in this case, the valuation that makes P true, Q false and R false. So a counter example to the argument from P or R to P and Q or R, we give that by saying, well, suppose that P is true, Q 
is false and R is false. That is a counterexample to this argument. There might be more than one. Every line in the truth table where you have a T for the premises and an F for the conclusion, that is a different counterexample to the argument in question. Validity. Validity is a concept we're going to hear a lot about in logic, and it kind of has a few slightly different uses. We can talk about a valid argument. An argument can be valid or invalid. That just means the premises do or don't entail the conclusion. OK, so a valid argument is one where the premises entail the conclusion. In other words, on every valuation where the premises are all true, the conclusion is also true. But we can also talk about a sentence being valid or invalid. Now, that might get a bit confusing, right? Because if validity applies to arguments and now we're saying a sentence can be valid, how can a sentence be the same as an argument? But actually, it makes pretty good sense given the way that we've set up what we mean by entailment. Let me explain. We're going to take validity of a sentence to be a special case of entailment. So if we're thinking about a sentence A and in order to say that it's a valid sentence, I'm going to write this symbol down. It's exactly the same as the symbol that we used for entailment. But in the case of entailment, we would have some premises here. We would have the premises entailing A as a conclusion. So what, what's going on here? Well, basically, imagine that we have just like no premises there. It's an argument with no premises, the empty set of premises. So zero premises entail A. That's what it is for A to be valid. In other words, A is entailed whatever, OK? Whatever our premises might be, even if there's none of them, A gets entailed. So it's like saying whatever the argument, whatever the premises are, even if there's none, A would be entailed. That's kind of what it is for A to be a valid sentence. What does that mean precisely in terms of valuations? Well, let's just think about it in terms of our definition of entailment. Entailment means on all valuations where the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. But if we don't have any premises, that's just going to mean on any valuation, the conclusion is always true. OK, so it's going to mean A is true on every valuation. That's what it means for A to be a valid sentence, true on every valuation. Actually, we've already encountered that idea, the idea of a sentence always being true, a T in every line of its truth table. We call that a tautology. So in the case of propositional logic, a valid sentence is just the same thing as a tautology. We can also call it a logical truth. Tautology, logical truth, valid sentence, they all mean the same thing. In the case of propositional logic, it means a sentence which has a T in every line of its truth table. Here's something that sometimes confuses people, and I wanted to clear up this confusion before we finish up today. What's the difference between these two things? If A then B, or sometimes we'll say A implies B, and this, A entails B. Often people get these concepts confused. There's kind of two ways in which they're different. This is a sentence of propositional logic. It's made up of A and B put together with the arrow, and that is in itself a sentence of propositional logic, something that we can say is true or false. It can be a premise, it can be a conclusion. This, on the other hand, isn't a sentence of propositional logic. A is, B is, and this whole thing is like our shorthand as the logician. It's a way of saying that A entails B. OK, that's our sentence, not a sentence of propositional logic. That's kind of a superficial difference. The, the real difference between the meaning of this symbol and this symbol is this. If A then B is something that may or may not be true, depending. It, it depends on how A and B come out. So for instance, consider the sentence, if I drop this mug, then it will smash. Well, that's true if I say it in the kitchen because it would drop on the tiles and they're hard and it will smash. But it's false in here, in the attic, because it's got soft carpet. If I drop it here, it won't smash. So if I drop it, it'll smash. It might be true, it might not be true, who knows? In the case of A entails B, it's not true or false relative to one or another particular valuation. Rather, it's defined in terms of all valuations. OK, so we look at all of the valuations and if all of them that make A true also make B true, then A entails B. And if not, A doesn't entail B. So this isn't logically contingent. It's like a, a necessary fact of logic. 
If A entails B, then that's a necessary fact of logic that A entails B. So this sentence, a material implication, isn't the same as a logical entailment, but they are related. They're related in the following way. A entails B, if and only if, the material implication if A then B is valid. If A then B, that's going to be valid just in case, if and only if, A entails B. Okay, so I hope that clears up that potential confusion. If you weren't confused about that, great. You don't need to worry about that last bit. So that is all for today. If you've enjoyed this content, consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to get updates and there's going to be more videos on Logic coming, hit the bell icon. Thank you very much for supporting this channel, for watching my videos. It means a lot to me. I hope to see you back here soon. <laughs>